Okay, so ProfitTrace uh, is a product of a company called Presentic. Uh, Presentic is a company based in the Netherlands. The headquarters is uh, based in the Netherlands. Um, they are quite widely recognized in industry as influencers in the Profibus Profinet um, and industrial ethernet space. Um, they mainly develop uh, diagnostic tools and solutions uh, for uh, industrial communication systems. Uh, just like IDX, they're also a fully certified competency center and training center with Pi International. Um, and how IDX and uh, Percentic relate is uh, IDX is a master distributor for Percentic. We have been for over 15 years. And our, our team is very highly um, qualified and uh, knowledgeable on their products and solutions and how to effectively use um, and uh, and support them. So if you have any questions related to any percent product ranges and that, uh, drop a mail to us. Um, you can either drop to the sales inbox or Academy at IDX. Uh, one of us will get back to you. So a couple of the products that uh, Percentic has, uh, obviously we're here today to discuss ProfiTrace. Um, this is one of the, uh, this is the flagship ProfiBus bus tester um, in industry at the moment. It's been very successful. Uh, and it's a fantastic tool with uh, lots of modules that, that help you to identify Profibus faults very quickly. Um, I can speak for myself and probably uh, the rest of the engineering team at the at the office, well, at the moment they're at home, but uh, they would never go to site without a profit core in their backpack and they actually take two in case they accidentally drop and break one. <laughs> or else they have to drive back and fetch another one. So uh, although a lot of Profibus diagnostics can be done visually, inspecting the network, walking uh, back up and forth to identify if there's any violations in the specification. Uh, for field bus systems like Profibus, it's very useful to have a bus tester that can give you eyes into the network uh, so you can see the true health of the network as well. A couple of the other products that you might know, not know about from Presentic, uh, they have a range of what they call ProfiHub. Uh, that's a range of repeaters or multi-channel repeaters. Um, really, really great for network isolation, segmentation, um, and flexibility in architecture. They have a permanent monitoring solution, which is modular called uh, Combrex. Uh, Combrex works in a similar way to ProfiTrace, however, it's ProfiTrace remotely, so you can access the similar features to ProfiTrace on your network wherever you are through a VPN connection or some sort of other Ethernet direct link. Uh, it also gives you notifications if there's any errors in your network. So the idea behind it is preventative maintenance um, and uh, picking up faults before they cause a network failure. I'll have a slide at the end of this where I'll discuss uh, Combrex in a little bit more detail. Uh, if you're interested in Combrex, drop us a mail and we, we are always happy to come and do on-site demos and proof of concepts as well. Really great solution. Uh, and I suppose, uh, while we add it, it's becoming more important now to have that remote capability of diagnosing a network. So having uh, support staff who cannot necessarily be on site um, as soon as you would like them to be or at all to be able to somehow connect into your network to assist you in identifying faults. So uh, so I think Combrex has, has got a very important role in industry. Uh, they've also released some software for profi net diagnostics called Netilities. And two of their newer products um, is the uh, Atlas and the Mercury. Uh, the Atlas is for permanent monitoring of industrial Ethernet networks, including Profinet, Ethernet IP, and Modbus TCP. And uh, the Mercury uh, works hand in hand with the ProfiCore, uh, but has a newer user interface um, that allows you to fetch ProfiBus diagnostics. Um, a really fantastic tool that they've released, but in addition to ProfiBus diagnostics, uh, it also supports uh, industrial. Um, Ethernet diagnostics as well and has a really great platform for industrial Ethernet diagnostics and fetching information out of your industrial Ethernet networks. So we're here today to talk about uh, ProfiTrace. If you do have a ProfiBus network, you do need a ProfiTrace. It helps you to quickly identify and understand problems. Uh, you should utilize it to perform regular network checks or we like to call them network audits. Make sure that your network is at the healthiest state uh, possible. Uh, also definitely aids commissioning uh, when setting up a plant. Make sure that you haven't accidentally inserted some sort of um, fault in the network that's that's going to rear its head at a later stage. And the ability to generate reports and create a snapshot in time of that network state uh, is very effective. 
The training kit uh, that I'm uh, using to assist me today in demonstrating some of the uh, features of Profitrace, uh, attached a picture of it. So going from left to right, uh, this is a, a Combrex unit. This is a passive um, Profibus device, which means that it, it doesn't actually have an address. It's completely invisible to the network. Um, we have this as a, it's called, it's a Presentic IO module. It has uh, four, four digital inputs and four digital outputs. Uh, we've got uh, two gateways, a, a VP gate, a Presentic VP gate and an Anybus communicator. They're just going to act as Profibus slaves for us. Uh, I do like using gateways in uh, training because they have flexible configurations because the IO amount of input and output data to the Profibus network can vary depending on what you set it up to. So it's pretty useful for me demonstrating uh, different submodules within devices. And then this is a Kunbus Revolution Pi uh, connected to a Profibus uh, DP card. This acts as a DP slave. It would allow you to interface um, uh, a Linux processor with a Profibus network. If, for example, you wanted to fetch information from the network and do something useful uh, in the network. Uh, so it's a pretty, pretty cool product. Uh, if you check on our YouTube page, I have a, a demonstration of Revolution Pi and an introduction on how to use it. Uh, so you can check that out as well. If there's anything else you'd like to see, do let us know. All right, so let's jump straight into Profi Trace without uh, Further ado. All right. So when you open up Profitrace for the first time, this is the screen which you will be prompted with. Uh, your first port of call whenever you once you've plugged in your Profi Core device uh, is to start up the Profi Core or initialize Profi Core Ultra. And there's a button over here called init Profi Core Ultra. Um, sorry, let me just change my screen. All right. And Get rid of that. All right. So in this Profical Ultra, so when you click Initialize Profical Ultra, it'll do some processing. Uh, and hopefully it'll get to the screen where it says Detecting uh, Board Rate. Now, if you connect into a live network uh, with your Profical and you select Initialize Profical Ultra, it's going to detect the board rates of that live network and synchronize to that board rate. Then it'll automatically load up all the tools of Profitrace, um, including the uh, live list and the scopeware features. Uh, it's not doing it right now because I don't actually have an active master available in the network at the moment, which means the network is not active. I'm with you going to build up the network uh, using an integrated master, which the Profitrace software has built in it. Uh, one thing I would like to point out, and you'll probably find this the first time you download Profitrace, uh, is licensing of the Profitcore Ultra. And this is quite a, a common thing we do run into. So the Profitrace software it's, uh, itself is actually completely free. You can download it from the Procentic website at any point. It is licensed by the Profitcore, which is connected to it. So once you connect your Profitcore into your computer uh, and you say initialize Profitcore Ultra, it's probably going to give you a prompt saying, that there is no license installed. You simply follow the prompts and it'll take you to a screen that looks like this, says license info tool. And all you need to do over here is just click download and install license. Make sure that your laptop has an internet connection and it'll automatically download that license from the Presentic uh, servers, which will uh, then allow you to start up your uh, profi trace. But I already have the license installed on my laptop, so I bypass that step uh, automatically. So when I come back to all these features at the moment, the tab I'd like to take you to is Profi Captain. Profi Captain uh, is a Profibus master simulator. It uh, works in a very similar way to all the other configuration softwares uh, for all the large vendors uh, PLCs or Profibus PLCs. And it's very useful in both training how to set up a Profibus configuration, but also training yourself on Profibus faults. Um, a scenario that you would utilize this is if you had a profi core and you wanted to possibly train a new intern, um, uh, intern technician on your site on uh, basic profi bus problems and how profi bus works and show them some of the tools. Uh, you can use this to simulate a small network in your workshops uh, very easily, uh, which will give them good insight and, and a feel into how, how the, the device should behave. 
what this profi captain also has is class two master commands. Uh, if you attended our introduction to profi bus um, week before last, uh, we spoke about class two commands being a diagnostics master, which allows us to do additional functionality in a network. Uh, so some of these uh, commands could be a network scan. Uh, you could get the configuration of a device, the physical inputs and outputs of the device, um, active diagnostics on the device and changing the uh, address of a device. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to <clears throat> scan the network to check which devices are actually available uh, for me to view. So I'll just hit your aha, master must be online. So to make a master online, you say set up master, you click operate. Click close. Class two master commands, and then you start scan. Now it's detected that I have four slave devices on my network. Station 10, which is a VP gate. Station 11, which is my IO module. Station 12 is my Anybus gateway. And station 13 is my Kunbus Revolution Pi. I can verify those four addresses if I tap across here into my live list. And um, on my live list, you'll notice that there's these blue numbers. They say ID equals, and it's got some four digit hexadecimal value. And you'll see that there's a single red number at one. So the red number indicates the masters on the network. So I've just enabled my profi captain, which is acting as a master on this network. And then you have your um, four blue numbers. A blue number is a slave device, which has not yet gone into data exchange. So the ProfChase software has identified there are devices available in the network, but these devices are not an active communication. Okay. And this four digit hexadecimal number is a unique identifying number for slave devices on the network. Uh, the, every single device is given this unique identifier when it is certified, and it helps the master to identify um, that it has the correct configuration uh, for a device. So, what I can do to quite quickly add my devices, I can filter my GSD file. So I can either type in that identity number, which I read there. So I have 6980, for example, in this first block. 6980, there's my VP gate, great. Drag that in. But probably an easier way to do it is it actually has a block over here called last network scan. So if I click on last network scan, then it will automatically um, show all the devices which are scanned when my last, um, when I did the class two command for network scan. And that makes it easy for me to add in multiple devices. So I've already added in 6980. Now what I can do is add in 6960, which is my IO module. It's quite simple. So all I'm doing is I'm dragging the GSD files listed on the left over here into the panel at the top so that the master knows that what devices he's connecting to. Then I have my Anybus communicator, which is my third gateway, and then my Revolution Pi at 13. Now, there are a couple of built-in GSD files when you get ProfiTrace software out of the bat, but uh, you can add in additional GSD files for devices specific to your plant. You do that simply by clicking Settings, you can say add or copy a GST to catalog. Um, and then once you do that, it'll bring up a uh, page. You can simply click on the GST file you want to add and it'll add it automatically into the um, ProfTrace software. Uh, I've got quite a few GST files from training uh, over the years. It automatically categorizes these into device functions for me. Uh, the set, so the first step, dragging in the GSD file onto my dashboard so the master is made aware of what the GSD file. The second step is going to be giving the device an address. Right? So if I have a look here, my VP gate was address 10. Double click, enter in address 10. Click again. My IO module was at address 11. My Anybus module is address 12. 
and finally my revolution pi is that address 13. Important to remember that every single device on a network needs to have a unique address and the address which you're specifying here in your profit captain needs to correlate to the actual physical address of the device which is installed in the field. So they need to match each other. The next step is I need to tell the master what is the IO buildup of this device. So every single device could have a unique IO buildup. And the reason this isn't fixed is because Profibus devices have the capability of having very varying um, IO module buildups. An example of this would be an ET200 station, uh, for example, or an IO station, where you can have multiple hardware cards that can be added to it depending on what your application is on site. Um, so if, for example, you needed uh, 10 digital inputs and four analog inputs, you would need probably two digital input cards and a single analog input card. Now you need to tell the master what cards have I added into that hardware component so that the master knows what data to fetch from that device. Now, there's two ways I can do this. I, I could actually physically go look at the device um, and then based on looking at the device, seeing what hardware modules are, I can add that in. Uh, an, an example of that, if I have to go to IO and choose my ET200 station, um, I could physically use this code here uh, and Siemens uses this uh, 6ES7-321 code um, as unique for every single hardware module that can be added within this network. So I can verify that physical code which will be printed on the hardware module on site and add it in the order from the head station to the last device. So very important that it gets added from the head station working its way down needs to be in the correct order. Simply by adding it, you can just double click and it'll add it. So there's my eight digital input, four digital input, and then I'd need to go find my analog input card. And that's how I could um, physically add that. There is another way, I'm just going to remove this because I don't have an ET station. Another way I can verify what an IO buildup is, is using a class to command, this get configuration. So get configuration, I'll simply enter in the address I'm interested in. So I'll to address. 10, which is my um, my VP gate. Uh, so some background between what the VP gate is. It's a serial to Profibus converter. So it takes in um, a serial signal, for example, uh, Modbus RS45 uh, or 232, and it converts that to a Profibus signal. So it allows us to um, connect serial or Modbus devices to a Profibus network, which is useful for things like um, uh, I suppose load cells, way scales, generator controllers. Uh, there's lots of Modbus devices that we want to integrate into our Profibus network. If you want more information on Modbus, uh, go check out our introduction to Modbus video as well. So then I hit get configuration. Now it automatically scans using a class two command. It scans the slave at address 10 and asks him for what is, what is his physical configuration? What is his actual configuration? Um, and he identifies that he has the configuration of uh, 168 inputs and 132 outputs. So 168 bytes of input and 132 bytes of output data. And it gives me this hexadecimal configuration information. I will go into detail on what that is a little bit um, later, but it's basically how um, Profibus devices can transfer information related to that submodule based on how much input and output data um, that submodule can give, uh, how the data is supposed to be treated, and whether the data is an input or an output module. So 168, 132, and uh, this is my configuration buildup. And then I could try, for example, address 11, which is my uh, four digital input, four digital output. Aha, and he only has one byte of input and one byte of output. I don't need a lot of data to transfer digital inputs, it's a single bit uh, for every single input and a single bit for every single output. And he's got the hex buildup of 2010. So let's go set up that device first. Let's press 11, set up modules and parameters. Now, if I physically click on this module, I can see that it shows me at the bottom here that raw configuration data. So this is the same buildup that I saw in my class to command, 2010, which specifies one byte of input and one byte of output. So I physically double click and it adds that module into my selection. While I'm here, I can show you a couple of other things which are available in the configuration. There's user specific parameters. Now, this is how you want a device to behave. Um, this would be 
um, settings available to the PLC programmer on uh, additional functions which a device can enable. And then module related parameters and how I want to set this physical module up. The best example of a good module parameter would be an analog input card. I could set it up to either be 4 to 20 milliamps, 0 to 10 volts, uh, 0 to 20 milliamps, or depending on what are the analog inputs that are feeding into that device. Over here, because there's four bits of input, it's got a couple of useful uh, things for me. I can actually simulate the input. So this is a nice training device. Uh, maybe I want to do uh, a zigzag. So then I just click apply value and it's going to allow those inputs to zigzag. My last step is I just need to activate the device. So what I've done is I've dragged in the GSD file. I've assigned a physical address. I've added various modules, which I need to, based on the physical hardware buildup of that device, and then I just put the device to active. And what I should hope to see now is a little green block at the top here indicating that the device is healthy. If I go into my live list, now suddenly you see the background of that device 11 in my live list is green, indicating it is in data exchange, it is healthy, it is happy. Okay. We can move on to address 12. He's got two bytes of input only, which is identified by hexadecimal configuration build up 50. Great. So I click down here and I can see there's until I find my two bytes of input and confirm my raw uh, configuration identifier is 50. Double click here, click OK and activate and he goes green. All right. Uh, now for the Converse gateway and for the VP gates, I can actually specify how much input and output data I want to set on these devices. Um, although he has, if I look at, uh, for example, 10, uh, he has 160 bytes of input, 132 bytes of output with this large identifier to identify all the submodules. Um, I can actually change that to match something different. Uh, so maybe here I want to read 16 input words, which is identify 5F. And then I would like to read 16 output words, which is identifier 6F. So 32 inputs, 32 outputs. Some of the user parameters here are actually very interesting. So this gateway, is every, every setting in this gateway is configured by the PLC software. So I can even configure the subnetwork of the Modbus side from the board rate, which the Modbus side must read at, uh, data bits, uh, what type of protocol I want to read. So Modbus RT or ASCII. Um, on the other side of the network. Do I want the device to act as a master or a slave? And then what are the physical um, data, what are the data bits that I want to read from that Modbus side? And then module, this guy does not have any module specific parameters. So the only parameters which I'd have would be user parameters and my physical module selection. So depending on my application is how I'd set this device up. Click OK, activate, and he goes green. Now, if I go back, what he used to be 168 and 132 output, if I scan him again, he's adopted what I have physically set him to take. So it depends purely on the device which you are integrating with as to what the configuration is um, and how you would physically set up that configuration. So he's gone green and then finally my Kunbus gateway. I can do the same. Maybe I'll just set him up as a um, input, output, no user or module specific parameters that are necessary and click activate. And now I've got four devices which are healthy. Great news. So that's all the process required within Profi Captain. I can save this configuration if I don't want to have to do it um, again. And trust me, China sets up a ET station with uh, 10 different uh, Hardware cards in it is a lot of work uh, to try and read all the codes and make sure that they're correct. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to save my configuration. I'm going to save it under my Profi Chase folder under the Lockdown Learnings. I'm going to save this as Kyle's config. I'll do that in case we accidentally close the program and want to set it up a little bit later. If I want to add this configuration back in, I can click Load Project. Some of the other settings which are available within this master, um, let me quickly go offline to show this. Uh, so I can change things like the board rate and some of the timing settings as well. And I can actually change something called a watchdog factor. I'm going to talk about watchdog in a little while. I want the master to go back online and this will allow me to go through the rest of the modules. Now, 
This is the typical screen that you would be prompted by if you had to connect into a live network. In a particular live network, you wouldn't actually have to use Profi Captain at all. In fact, you probably shouldn't use Profi Captain because remember you might create a collision on the masters uh, if you accidentally set the master onto the same address as the current active master in the network. So all that would be required in a live network is you simply to connect into the network and hit Initialize Profica Ultra. Alternatively, you can also say uh, auto detect board rate and you'll automatically detect what is the board rate of the active bus which he is connected to. Yeah. Now this panel over here is what we call the live list panel. It's got a couple of useful features. So the first one in front of us uh, has a list of all 126 addresses which can be connected in a network. It's a very quick view on what devices are active on this network and he will show up all devices in the entire network regardless of repeaters or fiber optic modules that are separating. So it shows you all devices on all segments. Um, there's a very useful button over here called show scope image. And when you click show scope image, uh, he gives you a snapshot of the physical um, signal of each of those specific devices. And this is a very nice quick overview way to check. Uh, are there any problems in the segment? Uh, very quick high level. So for example, I'm going to um, affect the appearance on my network just by removing a termination switch um, and I immediately see it's affected device 12 so that scope image has changed. And I can put that back again. Or I can do something like shorting out the network and it affects almost everybody. So immediately on a high level, I can see everybody's healthy or not. When I click on a device, it also updates me on the physical state in a panel on the left over here of that device. You can see there's a little red flashing light on device 12. If I click on that, he's telling me that he has some sort of extended diagnostics. He doesn't specify what type of extended diagnostics because the ProfTrace doesn't have enough information to decode this. Um, I would at this point go check the user manual uh, and identify what does that extended diagnostics bit mean. The user manual should define that for me. Uh, in this case, it means that my redundant power supply on one of my devices is not connected. So that's why he's giving uh, an error message to us at that point. All right, uh, the next screen that would be useful to us here would be messages. Now, messages, I can hit your start message recording. And what he does is he immediately records and displays all the telegrams traveling through the bus. So he's interpreting all the data signals and sniffing all the data on the network. So I can see device one, which is my master, is speaking to all of my devices in the network from 10 to 11 to 12 to 13. 10, 11, 12, 13. So you can see he moves from the lowest address up to the highest address. Uh, in the Profibus Engineers course, we go into quite a detail on what these messages mean, how to decode them, um, and all those different bits. Uh, one thing that is pretty useful, though, is um, utilizing these messages to try and identify some sort of fault. Unfortunately, we don't have enough time to go into too much detail on that today, uh, but I can show you one thing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, unpower a device. All right, and then I'm going to, after unpowering a device, I'm going to start message recording. And then I will power that device back on. All right, now I can stop message recording and I can actually create a setup search, which allows me to search for specific messages on the network. So what I'm interested in this case is the diagnostic response, set parameters and check config messages. And as I hit search down, I can immediately see that in order to go into data exchange, the master sends various different commands to that slave device to get them into data exchange. So here, this uh, specifies uh, that the device is not ready. Uh, he needs to be parameterized. Right, and my next one is set the physical parameters. So he enables some of the settings on the device that are useful to that device. And you'll notice here that watchdog time is set there, 3,000 milliseconds. That's the same watchdog time I showed you in Profi Captain that you can change. So I can edit that um, and, and see as well. And then the last one is the check config, and that's where the master verifies, does the slave device have the same configuration buildup that we did? And we can see here, it's got that 50. Hmm, that, that looks a little bit familiar. It looks quite similar to the hexadecimal buildup over here of two bytes of input. Let's go check. Yep, 50. So 
what the master is doing is he's verifying does this slave device have the same configuration as he has been told to and this is where they make um the, this is where they uh, verify that step and a final guys get diagnostics request everything is happy that device goes into data exchange okay i then have my station statistics view so let me just click file new now this is actually pretty important whenever connecting to a new network or a new segment um, or you finish analyzing a certain part of a network always hit file new what it does is it clears the network buffer um, and basically starts you off on a fresh canvas so that previous recordings do not misinterpret the future dates that's supposed to come in so there's a couple of very useful statistics um, which which we utilize to identify faults in profibus networks uh, so the first of these statistics would be something called sinks a sync is where the plc is programmed to look for a device but that device is not available on the network um, i could for example add in my et station again let's put them to address 15. i'm just going to add a random module into this configuration go active and immediately at address 15 you can see that this counter is constantly incrementing it's because the plc is looking for the et station i just configured in my master but he's not available uh, another situation if i empower my device 12 again now device 12 is off but the master's still looking for that device so every single cycle he's scanning is that device there if he's not the software will register that as a sync address when i power that device back on he'll go back into data exchange and my sync's counter will not increment um, in practice i find that syncs are very commonly connected uh, you find syncs very often on networks Purely that's because uh, I think that um, it's a strategy maybe for future expansion where a whole lot of um, slave devices are added into the PLC configuration, but that stage of the upgrades in plants has not been completed yet. Or possibly um, devices have been locked out or disconnected because there's maintenance being run on motors. Uh, that could be another reason for sinks. Um, Sinks I don't really find as an indicator of network issues, but rather a question, should this device be here that's incrementing on sinks? Um, and if it is supposed to be here, why is it not here? So, so then I can uh, immediately click uh, reset the statistic. Now, a couple of the statistics which indicate problems on my network would probably be retries. So, a retry is where a master tries to send a message to a device. The device does not respond, so the master will retry again. Uh, the number of times he retries this is a setting set in the PLC. Um, I would advise that the setting should always be three, so the master should at least try three times. That just gives him a little bit more opportunity to try uh, get control over the bus uh, before creating um, a trip or a failure. Um, and retries only increment once for every single time a device is lost so for example i'm going to power off my device 12 again and you can see that he increments by one power him off again ah, he didn't go into state exchange okay so retries uh, are quite a uh, they're an indicator that there's issues on your network if a master is having to go through the process of retrying or, or trying to send a message to a station, not actually getting a valid response for that station. Something's happening to that message when it's coming back to you. Either the device is uh, disconnecting itself, could be faulty. Uh, it could be due to uh, electromagnetic interference, which is uh, interference out in the field from uh, electromagnetic and static fields. Um, or it could even be something like a duplicate uh, a profibus address on the network so if you get retries it's an alarm bell there, there is an issue on the network uh, stations lost so that's uh stations lost will occur once the retries times out all right so for example you could have your retries set to three which means the station's lost will not increment until it's retried at three times and it's basically the master said oh, okay i've lost this device let me move to the rest of the networks and I will come back to that. Okay. 
So station lost and recharge work hand in hand. Legal responses to requests is a statistic that you should pay a lot of attention to. Um, a legal response to a request indicates that the master received a response back from the slave device. He can identify that it was a response from the slave device he sent a request to, but that response was corrupted in some way. Um, the ways that a response can get corrupted, um, me the message could be shorter than it's supposed to be. If the master is expecting a 14 byte message and it only returns 30 bytes, that means somehow it is cut off, there's a problem. Uh, but more often you, it results in something called parity errors. Now, one of the checking mechanisms within um, the Profibus communications is that there's a, a parity bit. And the parity bit checks every single data frame or eight byte frame, the parity bits must make that frame even, for example. So if the eight bits in a frame, um, if, if you add these all together and they make odd, the parity bit would be one to make it even. If they make it even, the parity bit would be uh, a zero. Now, if it checks that parity bit and that parity bit that does not make every single frame in a telegram even, then it will identify that as an illegal request, which means the message has changed somehow. So the message has been corrupted somewhere and there's uh, quite a few issues, very similar to what I mentioned for rechars, could be from um, duplicate addresses, uh, electromagnetic interference, it could be wiring shorts, um, uh, it could be even segments too long, missing terminations that can result in legal responses to requests. So as soon as I see illegal responses to requests, immediately an alarm bell comes up. And there's a few other statistics based on, um, for example, input and output sizes coming from devices. So this matches what I configured earlier in my Profi Captain um, with my 32 bytes in and out of my BP gate. This is my four digital input and output module. This is my Nibus communicator and here's my uh, revolution pi, which I configured to one byte of input and one byte of output. And then it has some uh, timing settings, uh, which would be the, so the slowest and fastest data exchange intervals. This is also something that uh, you should pay attention to. You should not expect varying what we call cycle times. So time intervals, which it takes to communicate. So uh, in this case, the slowest that it took to communicate this first device was 1.8 milliseconds in the fastest this was just over one millisecond. Uh, I can see with device 12, he took up to 16 seconds to communicate uh, with slowest connection and then as fast as 1.1. So that's that's also another alarm bell to me. Why did he take so long? Obviously, I was harassing the device by disconnecting and reconnecting him to the network. All right. And uh, that's that, that's pretty much it for, for the live list. Uh, what I would like to do now quickly is move into overview tab. Overview tab is a nice first port of call uh, when connecting into a live network. It very quickly tells you um, without too much um, investigation whether the network is 100% or whether there's underlying issues on that network. Uh, it's got a robot here. Red means that there's critical errors in the network. Orange, there's errors, but the network is relatively stable. Um, and green means the network is 100% um, uh, fine. Uh, obviously, you need to delve a bit deeper into some of the tools, but this is a very quick indicator, uh, even for an untrained uh, eye, whether everything is acceptable or not. Uh, below the the um, <coughs> below the robot, uh, overseas are referred to it as a traffic light. They find it very strange that we have robots in South Africa. Uh, there's a console. So in your console, it indicates all the different error statistics which are on the network, which are relevant to you. Uh, these could be electrical statistics, so low voltages, high voltages, um, idle voltage errors, or it could actually be based on my repeats, my sinks, um, and my lost devices on these networks. So I can actually reset these. I'm just going to click File, New, and Green. Everything's 100% on my network. Let me go and harass my network again and short it out. Okay, so what I did now is I shorted out one of my cores. I shorted out one of my B-lines to shield uh, and immediately he started dropping all the volts on my network. So he's immediately indicated to me that there's, there's obviously severe issues on this network. So I'm immediately getting an idea. I need to look a little bit deeper into some of these issues. So uh, he's telling me there's a very low risk margin. Oh, sorry, very high risk margin rather. Um, 
Um, the voltages below on addresses 1, 10, 11, and 13. So I probably need to jump into my, um, my, my scopeway modules and my bar graph modules to investigate that a little bit further. Um, and I actually also uh, had a repeat message to uh, address 13. I didn't lose address 13 because there's no loss devices, but I didn't receive a valid response, uh, and that's why I had to repeat my message. Um, on the right hand side here, there's a uh, incrementing panel which increments uh, all my different statistics on the network. So if I power off my device 12, you can immediately see my sinks start incrementing. Uh, my slaves last incremented by one. Power it back on, everything is fine again. Uh, it also shows you the slowest and fastest times. So this is a very nice quick um, panel to get a lot of information about your network um, in an easy way uh, without going into too much too much detail. Okay. Now the next thing I want to do is jump back into my slide presentation and I can take you through a couple of common faults. Okay. So we jumped through the live list um, to get you into a bit more detail on the live list, the different uh, versions. The first thing I already showed you was the red number. Whoopsie. Uh, the red number, let me just pull up my laser point here. Uh, okay, so the red number at the top over here, that was my master. So any red numbers are indicated by master no masters. Any blue numbers uh, indicate slave devices on the network. If the color of the background color of a block is green, it means that the device is in data exchange. It's healthy, it's happy, it's talking to the master. If it's yellow, it means that it was in data exchange at one point whilst you were connected, but it has since been disconnected. So devices intermittently jumping between a green background and a yellow background indicate that the device is falling away from connection. That's a, it's a problem, I need to have a look at that. Um, a red block indicates to me that uh, most likely the red block would indicate that there's uh, some sort of uh, PLC programming fault. So you've put the wrong GSD file uh, into the network. Uh, it could also indicate that a device is at the wrong address. So where I've told the master, I expect device A at address 10 and actually device B is at address 10, it would probably indicate as a red block as well to indicate, hey, listen, you have the wrong device um, for my address. Uh, purple also configuration fault. Uh, this is where I've mismatched my IO configuration. Uh, so where my ET station has a four digital input card and a four analog input card, uh, I've actually told it something different. So uh, that's indicating, listen, there's a mismatch between what the PLC program says there is and what the physical device says there is. Now, from experience, I've learned to take the software configuration as the last cause of a fault because it's very seldom that the software configuration is actually uh, what is causing a fault on the network. So examples of uh, where the configuration would actually be right for the purple block is maybe on my ET station. The four analog input card is there, but it's faulty and it's damaged. So the device can't read it properly, which means that although my PLC is being programmed correctly for that device, the device actually has a physical problem. And for my red block where I'm saying that there's a GSD wrong mismatch, it's normally not the wrong GSD file added. It possibly could be a device at the wrong address. And if there's no color, it means that a device is available on the network. So it's physically there, but it's not programmed anyway. So the, the master doesn't know about it. He hasn't been told about that. Yeah. We spoke about a couple of the uh, useful statistic messages um, in our live list. Now let's quickly jump into Scopeway. Now I've always said that the best indicator of um, the best indicator of the health of a Profibus network is in the scope image. Uh, and what you expect to see is the scope image to be nice and square like this. You expect it to be uh, have round corners, not have too much ringing in it. Uh, it shouldn't be distorted in any way. Uh, and this would normally indicate a pretty pretty healthy signal traveling on the Profibus network. So it's very useful to connect in a high-speed oscilloscope. Profitrace has an integrated high-speed dual-channel oscilloscope uh, to help us do exactly this. A couple of things which uh, we could find um, on this oscilloscope that would help us identify faults. I'll go through a couple of scenarios, and then I'll jump into my Profitrace and I'll simulate some of those scenarios for you as well. 
the first one, wire break uh, or termination error. You can see a complete distortion uh, of the of the cable signal. So um, I, I can immediately see that uh, my entire signal is, is distorted. And then it highlights over here that the difference in my cursors, uh, the voltage is pretty low. And I'll show you that in a minute that I'm actually looking at the amplitude of the signal to tell me what is the actual um, signal strength. All right. And then the other one is these horizontal cursors over here. They would indicate the distance to the potential fault. So I can actually drag these around. I would start off at the, the end of the bit and drag my second cursor to where things kind of where things fall off the bus a little bit. And uh, this would give you an estimation of what is the distance that fault. So here it's saying it's about 60, 63 meters um, potentially to that uh, to that fault area. Uh, so that's that, that, that that's very useful actually if, if I want to identify where a potential problem is uh, to give me an idea where to start looking. This is an example of a short circuit between A and B. Short circuits uh, occur very commonly in Profibus connectors uh, that are poorly wired. Um, and also, especially within field devices that have a higher IP rating, if that IP rating fails for whatsoever re reason, if it's a rear panel um, and the cabinet's left open, uh, and you find that there's uh, coal, coal dust that gets in there or water or something, it could short circuit your entire segment. Uh, this indicates definite wiring problem uh, and I, I need to have a, an investigation to a little bit further. Too many terminations. Um, so over terminations are normally identified by very low voltages. Um, and then it also can indicate to you a total distance from where you can see that little um, upswing of that voltage, the difference between it. So too many terminations, low voltage, and I'll simulate that. And power termination, I have a look at my idle voltage. Now in Profibus, uh, Profibus has polarizing resistors uh, that help to step up the entire signal by one volt. Uh, it helps to make it a little bit more interference free uh, in noisy environments that Profibus usually operates. So my idle voltage between telegrams should always be at one volt. If I see that at half a volt or at zero volt, it means that I have an unpowered termination or two unpowered terminations somewhere on the network. EMI, noise interference. So hopefully you're joining us for um, our talk tomorrow on um, uh, bonding and grounding, uh, functional bonding and grounding for industrial communication systems. We'll talk about this in a lot more detail, uh, but you often see erratic um, injects of noise onto the signal that it indicates some sort of noise or interference. So where there's a high voltage cable um, or some sort of electromagnetic device, a uh, very noisy device that is inducing um, this uh, signal onto your Profibus network, this often results in illegal messages, lost devices, and network trips. And then we're also going to have a look at our bar graphs. So what our bar graph actually is, is it's a summary of the amplitudes of all our different devices. So each of our devices have a, a signal, right? It has a look at the peak in the trough of that signal um, and summarizes it here for you. You expect your bar graphs have to be between 2.5 and 7.2 volts. So it must be below 7.2 volts, but it must be above this red line, which is 2.5 volts. Um, yes, I think the higher voltage isn't too much of an issue. If you have devices pushing up to 7.2 volts and um, you've confirmed there's no termination errors in that, it's normally not too much of a problem. However, the lower voltage is a very big problem for me, and I generally um, start getting concerned if I see voltages uh, below about three and a half volts. As soon as it starts dropping below that three and a half volt range, although the specification says two and a half, um, I immediately need to investigate the source. And that could be over terminations, it could be wiring errors, it could be uh, segments that are too long, or it could be too many devices uh, on a segment as well. And if you remember your too many devices on a segment, your segments are limited to 32 devices, um, and the segment length is dependent on the board rate. Um, Duplicate addresses are one of the fun things to find. I'll try and simulate a duplicate address uh, for you shortly. Uh, but what you typically see in your scope image is uh, quite erratic behavior. And what you actually find is there's two signals overlaying each other. And that's where you get this very erratic uh, signal for the two devices, uh, what we call fighting for control over the bus. Uh, another way to identify duplicate addresses, in this case, it's address 11, is you'll notice that the signal jumps up and jumps down uh, in the bus monitor. 
And this is because the bus monitor can identify the device and the device falls away, um, obviously with the erratic uh, scope image of the signal on the network. So duplicate addresses are, are a lot of a lot of fun to find on a network um, and, and definitely don't hide themselves very well. So, so uh, yeah, and then obviously from my, from my um, message trace, I can see there's a whole lot of parity errors. Uh, obviously, the two devices at address 13 are corrupting each other's uh, telegrams, resulting in illegal messages. Okay, so let's uh, let's jump back into Profi Profi Trace again. All right. So going to my scope image. Now, immediately, this is in free running mode, which means that the scope image being displayed here is the um, is the scope image for all the devices that are actively communicating. If I want to have a look at the scope image of an individual device, I should double click on that down in the live list at the base of here. So I simply do that double clicking and this would be the signal, the locked signal of device one, which is my master. Uh, you can change the scale or the time scale of this uh, simply at the top here. Uh, we're running at 1.5 megabits per second. I would normally use a time scale of about um, uh, 10 microseconds um, to to give me a view of, of the of the entire um, signal frame. Uh, so this is a pretty healthy looking signal. On the left over here, we have the request. So this is coming from the master. You can see my idle voltage is sitting there at a nice one volt. And then this will be the response from whichever device is connected. And I can double click through 10, 11, 12, and 13. Okay, so that signal looks pretty healthy. If you see something like that on your site, uh, you do not need to be too concerned. This little spike, uh, which you see at the top of here, this is actually being caused by myself. Um, I'm causing this uh, spike by connect. I've got a stub line plugged in um, to connect my testing tool into the network. So that, that's what's causing that, that spike over there. All right, so what I can do is I can actually choose to freeze the image if I wanna do some testing on it and unfreeze the image. But what I wanna do quickly, let's, uh, Let's drop down this to about 2.5 so we can zoom into a frame a little bit better. Uh, then I'm going to create an error on the network. Okay, so missing termination. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to freeze that image and then I can activate my cursors. So now the first thing I can do with my cursors is my horizontal cursors allow me to have a look at the overall amplitude and I probably need to check that in the middle somewhere so I can immediately see that the difference between my, so let's go a little bit higher, it normally samples in the middle of the bit so it'd actually be a bit more accurate to drop it around there and then somewhere around there. Uh, and then I can immediately see that the difference between my voltages is 6.73 volts, and that would be confirmed um, inside my bar graphs. Okay. Um, the second one I can look at is my vertical cursors. My vertical cursors are used primarily to identify distance to a specific fault. Uh, this is going to be very difficult to use in the scenario over here, purely because my segment lengths are less than a meter long, but, or sorry, my entire cable is less than four meters long, um, so it's not going to give me too much accuracy, but you can see that that would be less, uh, a very, very short distance um, amongst those faults. But in a plant where you have a 100 or 200 meter segment and you've got uh, some sort of error on the network, um, connecting your first horizontal cursor and the second horizontal cursor to the initialization of the problem, the fault, whether it's a short circuit wiring error um, or some sort of impedance mismatched, based on uh, incorrect terminations um, or, or an incorrect device. This can give you an indication on how far away from you, where you plugged in right now, is that problem. Okay. So let's, uh, let's have a look at a couple of other things. So the second thing on the top left over here, you'll see it says mode BA diff. So this is the combined signal. What's often very useful is to have a look at the A and B lines individually. Now, <clears throat> if you'd remember from our introduction to Profibus uh, discussion, we mentioned that in RS-45, the same signal gets transmitted on both the A line 
which is my green core over here, and the B line, which is my red core, but the signal is inverses of each other. These signals, when they get to a device, get combined, which help to cancel out noise and interference in the field. Um, or uh, purely because if noise is injected onto the bus, what, whatever is injected onto your green line and your red line uh, would probably be the same. And because um, it would actually overlay those two signals over each other, that signal would cancel itself out. So it's often very useful to have a look at your A and B lines separately. Where I find A and B lines useful is identifying uh, electromagnetic interference, but also for identifying uh, wiring shorts. So if I see, for example, my combined signal looks pretty healthy. And now if I short out my B line to shield, this looks like a pretty messy signal, but I'm not 100% sure what's going on here. I can identify that this, this is definitely a wiring problem or it's some sort of um, faulty device or something like that. Uh, but if I have a look at my A and B separate lines, I can very quickly see that my B line has been completely short circuited. My, my A line's a little bit disjointed, but it still seems pretty, pretty healthy. Uh, but there's definitely a short circuit in my B line. So uh, it would lead me to the conclusion that it's most likely a wiring fault in one of my connectors or possibly even a faulty device interface um, that has an electrical short circuit in it. Um, and I can do the same thing for, for my B line, which has been short circuited. Uh, and you might actually see a different picture if you click through the different devices. So 12 is obviously completely on the other side of the short circuit, where there is one is on this side of the short circuit, so it's not affecting it as much. Yeah. So having a look at your A and B lines is, uh, is, is very useful um, in identifying problems in this network. Bar graphs also um, very useful for identifying the odd one out. Um, if potentially you have one device out of 20 that has a very low voltage or some sort of varying or jumping up voltage, uh, it normally points to you that, that there's some sort of issue and you probably need to go investigate physically at that device. Um, you'll see around these bar graph voltages, they have these dotted lines. These dotted lines indicate the lowest voltage as well as the highest voltage uh, that has occurred on that network. You should not see much varying in these voltages. Uh, varying in these voltages would indicate um, various different areas from uh, electromagnetic interference uh, up to specific uh, wiring related fault shorts uh, and faulty devices. Uh, so as soon as I click File New, it will clear those errors and I can see everything is relatively stable. So removing things like terminations, immediately I can see that there's a bit of a bit of an issue in my voltages and I'll, I'll remove both my terminations and then that's when I can see my volts just go completely out of range. Uh, so I'm peaking at about 10 volts and that's purely because of the reflections that are, let me jump into my combined signal, the reflections that are being caused by the echo of the signal hitting the end of the line and bouncing back. And, and that's, so high voltages like this would, would pretty much the only thing that ever causes high voltages on a profibus network like above 7.2 volts would be a missing termination. So as soon as you see high voltages, you, your conclusion can immediately be, oh, there must be a missing termination. Let me go check the terminating resistors at each end of my segments. However, things like low voltages are, they've got a few more, um, a few more problems associated to them. So seeing things like a low voltage can indicate anything from, um, over terminations, so maybe if I have terminating resistors installed in the middle of my segment, uh, to uh, wiring short circuits, so shorting out my A and B lines, for example. So now I'm shorting my B line to shield, and immediately all my voltages drop completely off the signal, which makes sense. I've lost half my amplitude immediately because I've flatlined one of my uh, signaling cores. Okay. Um, and and low voltages, if you find that low voltages incrementally go down, so it almost like steps down the line under the network, um, and you can often, if you drop down here by sorted address and you sort from high voltage to low. Now, if you see the voltages stepping down, let's say over 20 devices, and then the last voltage is below that two volt range, it normally indicates to you that uh, your segment length is a little bit too long. Uh, so you're suffering from something called cable attenuation, which means that your voltage signal level is 
um, deteriorating uh, or dropping down as it goes down the bus. So you probably need to look to put a repeater in the middle of the segment. If you have the same effect, lots of voltages going stepping down, and it's more than 32 devices that are stepping down, that would normally indicate to you that you have too many devices on that segment. So same thing, you would need to put a repeater in the middle of that segment or change the architecture of your network um, to fit within the guidelines of, um, of uh, the Profibus specification uh, directly. Another thing that would indicate to you uh, both a long segment length above the required specification for that segment and too many devices would be a shark finning of the signal waveform. So you generally find uh, the leading edge of your signal would shark fin uh, into the end. Uh, and that's normally uh, pretty closely associated with, with, with errors in the network. Oh, sorry, with long segments or too many devices. Um, another tool that is integrated into ProfiTrace is uh, the topology detection. Um, now, topology detection has a couple of limitations. Now, you have to remember what the software does is it has a look at the signals, it has looks at the voltages uh, of the different devices, and based on that, it takes um, an algorithm to determine what is the logical topology. So, as for example, the voltage drops um, and the signal uh, changes down the line, uh, it gives firstly a correlation of which device should be first and which is last, and then how long it estimates the cables between those devices. Now, this does work well uh, in a very well installed network, but it's got a couple of uh, very strong limitations. So, firstly, the network needs to be running at either 500 kilobits per second or 1.5 megabits per second. There cannot be any repeaters on the network. The network can have no faults whatsoever, and that's, um, that includes any electromagnetic interference, that includes uh, missing or over terminations, uh, um, devices with um, a mismatched impedance, uh, are all things that can affect topology detection. So uh, if you have an error on your plant, I would highly recommend not to use topology detection because it's not gonna work and it's gonna feedback inaccurate information. Topology detection is probably useful in commissioning um, a single segment with no repeaters uh, and you just wanna verify what you've already confirmed. Um, and get into a nice picture format. But I think that the best way to get the topology of a Profibus DP network is to um, physically have personnel on site, walk the entire network, measure accurately the cable distances or use the meter markers on the cables, draw up that topology, print that topology out and stick it on the cabinet. Because uh, unfortunately it's, it's um, very difficult if not impossible to correlate the topology of a network, especially networks that are um, that are not installed 100% uh, according to specification. But how the topology detection works uh, automatically detects the devices. So I've got my master at 1, uh, 10, 11, um, uh, 10, 11, 13 and 12, um, and it's estimating the distances between that. Uh, the four meters is a little bit wrong, but mostly it got the, the architecture pretty right. Uh, obviously, I'm, I'm in, a, in a, a lecture environment over here. So that's how the uh, topology detection works. Now, one fantastic feature of ProfiTrace is reporting. Reporting takes a snapshot of everything in ProfiTrace, including uh, live list features, statistics, the uh, bar graph voltages and uh, images, as well as the scope images, and puts that all into a single PDF document that you can share, store, review, analyze, um, or send even to um, a Profibus engineer with more experience uh, in identifying those problems, uh, such as the, the PCC or, or IDX, um, where we work with Profibus a lot. So, it's important to note that when you generate a report, you should generate a report on every single segment. Now, why that's very important is segments are separated by either repeaters or fiber optic modules. Repeaters and fiber optic modules are optically isolated, which means that they are, I suppose the way to describe it is disguising what is actually on the other side of them. So if I connect them to segment A and I have a repeater separating me from segment B, the values which I'm seeing 
in segment A for the device in segment B is actually only going to be the values of the repeater or the fiber optic module. It's not the true values of the device in that segment. So I need to take my profit call, profit trace, and connect into every single segment on my entire network and generate a report on the segments to get a full um, overview picture of the true state of health of that network. So how I generate a report, I'll just click this button over here, report, generate report, location, office, network name is training DP kit, project details, uh, training, commissioned by RDX, remarks, um, identified short circuit on connector at device three. So nice information that can allow you to review, oh, what are the changes in this network? What happened over here? Uh, very often these reports should be completed after commissioning or upgrading certain sections of the plant. As a sign off procedure to check, is, is that network installed correctly? Name of the engineer, name of the company. And then I can hit generate report. And immediately it generates this PDF document. Uh, in the front here, it indicates what is my network speed, total number of devices, uh, the cycle times, any error statistics which are occurring on the network. It gives you a uh, image of your live list as well as a key that tells you what are the different faults. The worst and best images of the um, summary of the amplitude, so your bar graph voltages. It includes my topology detection, which I generated at that point. And then it gives me a snapshot of the minimum, maximum, and the last recorded scope images for every single device from device one, two, three, four. So obviously when you have a lot of devices on the network, these uh, PDF reports can get pretty long up to like, I've had one that's like 100 pages long before. Uh, we had quite a few devices. Uh, but these are very useful, and uh, if, if you are running into issues in the network, you're welcome to email these reports through to us, and, and we can do a bit of interpretation, see if, if we can assist you um, remotely on, on these systems as well. Okay. And then you can just save that and save it to PDF. So I'll save it against my profit choice, and I'll say Carl's report segment one. Save. Great. So now that is ProfiTrace and we are gonna jump into a QA and a session after this. And uh, if, if you would like a bit more detail um, on any of the aspects, uh, please do drop your messages and, and I'll be happy to uh, discuss a little bit further. A few things I just want to uh, get out of the way, make you aware of. Uh, so permanent monitoring, Combrex, a bit more detail. So Combrex can be thought of almost as a profi trace that is permanently connected onto your, your network. Uh, some of the features that uh, it basically would connect into your network, be permanently connected either hardwired in the bottom or through a sub D9 connector. You would plug in an ethernet cable onto this head station. And through that Ethernet cable, you can um, open up a web page by typing in the IP address of the Combrex. Uh, the web page looks like this, and it can indicate, it gives you a couple of tools which you can connect through the network to have a look at the overall health. Combrex also has an SD card, so it can record errors. If, for example, the network tripped over the weekend, uh, you can come in on a Monday um, <clears throat> and review what, uh, what, what the errors were to try and identify the fault that had occurred. I often keep a Combrex in my tool bag when I go to site. Uh, sometimes there is a fault on a Profbus network that is so intermittent that it occurs every four to five hours, and it, it's not really going to help me to stand there with my profit trace um, for four to five hours uh, waiting for an error to occur so I can identify what is the actual fault that was occurring. So sometimes I'll connect in a Combrex, leave that to run, go back a couple hours later. Um, uh, it's almost like creating a trap in your Profbus network to fetch that information that will help me to identify what the problem might be. Okay. Uh, as I mentioned, Combrex is modular, so you can connect multiple modules for multiple networks or segments. Um, 
And some of the features live list the same statistics view, such as legal messages, retries. Uh, it has message recording functionality, so it can record messages based on a trigger. So if the network fails, it records the messages which happened during that failure. Uh, it can email you any errors, so immediately alerting based on errors. Uh, and some of the complex modules have an integrated oscilloscope, so it can give you um, the, the scope image of that network as well as bar graphs. Um, and these can be integrated directly into um, OPC uh, servers as well. Uh, so if you want to integrate into your SCADA type systems, uh, that can be done as well. So here's a summary, live list and statistics, um, the status of the Combrex uh, itself, um, message recording functionality, it has a system log, so what happened uh, on, on the device and on the network, um, and can email you on any, any errors on, on the network. There's two ways you can use Combrex. Um, firstly, if you wanted to, as I mentioned, it's important to connect your profi trace onto every single segments of a network purely because repeaters and fiber optic modules hide the devices that are on the other side of them. And although you can see those devices physically as a, um, a telegram on the network, so I can see the address, I can see the messages from that device because it's a bus and everything is shared, I cannot accurately see the scope image nor the voltage driver levels of those devices on the other side of the network. It'll be hidden to me. So you can use Combrex to connect into each of the segments on one network, and he'll actually act as a multi-channel repeater. So he'll connect all these segments together, but feed you back information valid for each of those segments and the devices connected to them. Alternatively, you could, if you want to just connect a single Combrex in, if message statistics is sufficient for you, um, and you just want to know if there's legal messages, syncs or error messages and you want to be alerted of that information uh, then you can um, then you can get a, a a different model that would just connect once and for example at the plc uh, and he'll alert you on any errors of the network then you with one of your engineers or technicians can go to site uh, plug into uh, the affected segments and do the direct core diagnostics 